Hello, in this video I will share with you 4 tips on how to make your life easier if you are doing deep sky astrophotography on the Sky Watcher Star Adventurer that I have right here. And I already have videos on how to properly and precisely polar line this tracker and also a video on how to find interesting stuff in the night sky and how to frame them up correctly uh, in your camera using this particular setup. So if you haven't seen those videos, I will put the links to them by the end of the video. But in this video, I will focus on the things that I haven't mentioned before, but they are so useful and handy in order to ensure that you get the best possible results out of this particular setup and avoid unpleasant surprises in post-production. So without any further ado, let's get started. All right, so tip number one actually comes from a suggestion made by one of the viewers of this channel. So if you are this person, then thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. That is a valid suggestion. And it is related to balancing the declination bracket on your tracker, because if you are doing a preliminary balancing during the polar alignment, chances are that if you mount a lens hood, maybe you attach your external intervalometer somewhere on the cold shoe right here or something like this, or maybe you just zoom in and out, the distribution of mass with this particular setup here with regards to the axis of rotation, which is right here, will get slightly shifted. So you need to rebalance in order to make sure that the balancing is as accurate as possible. And balancing, again, is very important because this ensures that you are not draining too much energy from your batteries, so your batteries last longer, the tracking is more precise, etc., etc. So after you're doing your preliminary targeting at the stuff that you want to photograph, so you can just release the clutch like I showed in the previous video, and maybe something like this is your uh, actual position of the tracker that you need to photograph. And right here with this clutch, with this main clutch released, as you can see, the camera is slightly shifting downwards. So you need to make sure that when everything is mounted on the camera, battery is installed, SD card is installed, external intervalometer is put somewhere here, lens hood, the lens is zoomed all the way into its final focal length, then you need to rebalance and you need to make sure, as you can see, it kind of tips over down. So you can just, you know, undo this screw and kind of move this thing around, the counterweight, in order to make sure that you are actually balanced. And if you're balanced, if you let go of the clutch release, the camera should not rotate on its own. That's a giveaway that you have a correct balance. So it's good to check your balance after mounting everything and doing the preliminary targeting on the deep sky object that you want to photograph. But that leads me to actually tip number two, because as you can see, my counterweight is all the way down on this shaft. It's on its maximum position and I am still a little bit front heavy. As you can see, the camera tips down. So in this case, normally you might think that you might need to get another counterweight and it actually is a possibility. You can get this uh, counterweight separately and add it onto the shaft and link to that will be down below in the description. And by the way, in the description, there are all sorts of links to the gear that I use, to my camera, which is the Canon EOS R that I'm recording right now, the lens, uh, all the parts of this tracker. Those links are affiliated to Amazon. So if you want to support the channel, definitely check out one of my links in the description box. So before you actually go out and buy another counterweight, what you can do is actually you can undo this screw, but you need to be extra careful if you do that so that the entire declination bracket doesn't just slide down with the camera and crash into the ground. So hold it firmly with one hand then undo this screw and if it's front heavy actually slide it down a little bit and if you slide it down and you screw it in you can see that you are probably now heavy on the other side as you can see the camera moves in the other way so you can just use again the counterweight in order to find the correct balance in this case it will be somewhere like this so the position of the counterweight is actually up a little bit so you can use the length of this declination bracket to your advantage to move the center, to move the axis of rotation a little bit down or a little bit up, it depends on how heavy your camera actually is. And that leads me to tip number three, which is all about setting the correct exposure. So in my previous video, I was recommending that you can use actually a fairly short shutter speed and a high ISO to take some test shots in order to ensure that you get the correct framing. But you actually can use also the short shutter speed in order to set the correct final exposure settings of your camera. And here's what I mean, because the exposure triangle consists of, you know, ISO, aperture and shutter speed. And the aperture is pretty obvious if you are losing a lens like this, the best thing 
thing to do is just to have the aperture as large as possible. Given this particular lens at 300 millimeters, it is actually only f5.6, so it's not particularly bright, but it, this is as wide as it gets, so I'm just using that. If you use a slightly cheaper lens, you might get better optical performance if you stop down the lens one stop or something like this, so you can also take that into consideration. So setting the aperture is easy. Then setting the shutter speed is also pretty easy because with this uh, with this tracker like this, the Skywatcher Star Adventure, if you're not using an auto guider, typically with this kind of focal range, the shutter speed that I would recommend would be somewhere between two and three minutes. You want it to be long enough to capture actually a lot of light and take advantage of the fact that you are tracking the movement, the apparent movement of the, of the sky with regards to the ground, but also you don't want to make it long enough so the, the camera sensor will get hot and produce some hot pixels and also if something blows like a gust of wind blows into the tracker it might ruin some of your exposures so i think between two and three minutes is a good balance so let's say we are using two minutes and now the only unknown factor of the exposure triangle is the iso so how do we figure out the iso well you could just use two minutes shutter speed the widest aperture and tweak around the iso take some test shots and tweak it around in order to get the correct brightness of your image but having to wait two minutes for each test shot is a lot of time. So you can do some trick with a little bit of mathematical calculations. So assuming that the final shutter speed that you want to get to is two minutes, you can stop it down a couple of stops. And remember how many stops did you stop it down? So stopping it down one stop gives us the shutter speed of one minute. Two stops is 30 seconds. Three stops is 15 seconds. 4 stops is 7.5 seconds and 5 stops is 3.75 seconds which could be rounded up to 4 seconds. So you can use 4 seconds in order to find the correct ISO and in some cameras it is possible to actually adjust your ISO in one third of a stop increments as opposed to one full stop increment. So check your camera if you can enable it in settings. In terms of the Canon EOS R that I'm using it is possible but I had to unlock it in the settings so if you can use one third of a stop increments in ISO, you can be much more precise than just using full stops. And also, if the four seconds is too short and you need to actually make it a little bit longer, so for instance, you need to stop down from two minutes only four stops and not five in order to get the correct brightness. So that would lead to seven and a half seconds, which could be rounded down to seven seconds. And seven seconds in terms of my EOS R is actually not a shutter speed that I can set just using manual modes. So in this case, what you can do is you can go to the feature called bulb timer. It is available in the bulb mode on SAM camera. So again, you can check if your camera supports that. The Canon EOS R does support bulb timer. And by the way, there is a version of Canon EOS R that is dedicated to astrophotography. It is called the Canon EOS R A. So definitely check that out because that might be the camera that you need for your astrophotography. I will put the link to the Canon EOS RA also in the description box so you can check it out. And also one thing that you should keep in mind is that if you have two ISOs and one ISO is producing a slightly dimmer image that you would like and the other ISO is producing a slightly brighter image, it is always the best to use the lower ISO that produce a slightly darker image because for a very simple reason. You can always raise the exposure in post-production for just the amount that you need, adding just the right amount of noise that you actually need in order to produce the correct brightness. But if you start with a higher ISO, you will start inherently with a higher amount of noise straight from the camera and darkening down a little bit isn't going to remove that noise. So it's always better to use a slightly lower ISO than a slightly higher ISO. Remember that. And then, for instance, let's say that for 4 seconds shutter speed, I have settled that my correct ISO is 25,000. So all I need, if I go with the shutter speed to 2 minutes, is that I just need to lower the ISO by exactly 5 stops. So from 25,000, 1 stop is 12,000, 2 stops is 6,400, 3 stops is 3,200, 4 stops is 1,600, and 5 stops is 800. So using 800 ISO and 2 minutes of shutter speed, I know that I will get pretty much the same exposure as using 25,000 ISO and 4 seconds shutter speed. And using 4 seconds of a shutter speed is definitely way more convenient if you are taking some test shots and tweaking out the final ISO. So definitely take advantage of that tip. And the last tip number four is about avoiding surprises in post-production as I mentioned in the intro. And what I mean is that if you are taking photos of a deep sky object, there's a very, very high chance that on the back of your camera on the LCD screen, you will not see that deep sky object at all. If you're shooting a nebula or something like this, chances are that you are going to just see a bunch of stars. Hopefully those stars are sharp if you have everything set up correctly. 
and they will be on some kind of a solid kind of background because of the light pollution. It could be blue, it could be brown, depending on the white balance, but you will not see the nebula. So how do you know that you are framed up correctly before doing any of the heavy processing on the computer? Well, what I would recommend you to do is just take a first shot and dump it either into your computer or if you have uh, like a Bluetooth connectivity in your camera, you can just dump it straight from the camera to your phone if you're in the field. It doesn't need to be the raw version of the image, a JPEG version would do. But of course you need to acquire RAWs for the final post-production in order to get the best results. I think it's pretty obvious. But for what we are going to do here, JPEG is fine enough. So just take this image and load it into Lightroom. And then in Lightroom, as you can see, I have just a bunch of stars on a solid blue background. And the background is so blue because I was using an astronomic CLS filter. This is a filter that I have right here. It is supposed to cut down some light pollution because I actually live in a urban area. So the filter like this really helps with astrophotography. I actually have a bunch of videos about this filter, so I can put a link to the playlist up here and also in the description box if you want to check them out after you finish with this video. So we are starting with an image looking like this. And if you want to check out if you actually have the nebula in frame, what I would recommend you to do is just go to develop settings and crank up the dehaze all the way to 100, then take the contrast and also crank it up all the way to 100. And as you can see, I'm still pretty much not seeing anything. And as I said, the image is so blue because I was using this filter and I actually figured out how to deal with this blue color. And that is to use a custom made color profile. So I can go to color profiles. I use my Canon EOS R Astronomic CLS color profile, which will shift the white balance down to the blues where it belongs with this kind of color. And I have a separate video about how to take advantage of the custom color profile. So definitely check them out. It is on the playlist that I have mentioned and also in the description. So definitely check it out if you plan on using the CLS filter from Stronic. So right now what I can do is just warm it up just enough. And right here you can see around 7,000 that the nebula are starting to show up. This is the North American nebula right down below. And this is the Pelican Nebula up here. So if I see something like this for one of my frames in Lightroom, that I am absolutely certain, I am 100% certain that my camera is properly set up and I can leave it for two, three hours or however long you wanna capture your images. And I am sure that if I load up my images into my computer, I actually shot the nebula and not some just empty space with stars around because that would be a pretty nasty surprise after spending the entire night looking after the camera and figuring out that you didn't shoot anything interesting. So these were the four tips that I wanted to share with you. If you like this video, make sure to leave it a thumbs up down below. It really helps me out. Also leave a comment down below if you have any questions, if any part of the video was confusing to you, if you want to ask about anything, I pretty much try to answer every single comment I get on YouTube. So don't hesitate, just ask away in the comments. And also consider subscribing to the channel because there will be more videos like this. I pretty much upload new video every single week and I already have a bunch of videos on my channel with regards to astrophotography, with regards to the adventure and also things related to photography in general and also filmmaking. Basically my channel is all about things you can do with your camera so definitely check it out and right now as i promised in the intro if you want to see how to properly polar align this tracker click on the video right here and if you want to see how to target your camera into the deep sky object that you want to photograph and how to find them check the video right here and until next time clear skies bye bye